Hello, Rebels. What's up? This is Attorney Chloe Corbett, a.k.a. the Duchess of Justice. And with me, I have... Attorney Augustus Corbett, also known as the Minister of Justice. We are the Defiant Lawyers. We provide legal analysis of trending politics, policies, personalities, and pop culture to empower you to defy this unjust legal system. Before we get into today's topic, please like this video, smash that subscribe button, and share this video with your family and friends so that they too can become a part of the Legal Rebel community. With that, Dad, what's up? And what is our topic for today? All right. What's up, Chloe? You doing good? I'm doing well. What about you? I am just fine and fabulous. And <laughs> um, so we got a lot to talk about. Uh, you're looking really nice as always. Thank you. You as well. Get it from you and mom. Oh, you got it from your mom. Got it from your mom. <laughs> got it from your mom. <laughs> got I it from am your her mom. twin. <laughs> you are. You got it from her. All right. So, um, so I'm glad that you're doing well. And yes, by God's grace, I'm doing well as 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 well. Uh, there's a lot going on with the Arbery trial. There's a lot going on with the Rittenhouse trial. And we thought we'd come back and do an update on the Arbery trial because of a couple of things that happened this past week. A couple of crazy things, right? I mean, that trial is just, Insane. it's just, it's, it's filled with race. I mean, race yeah. is everywhere in that trial. And yeah. I mean, why are we even surprised? Race is everywhere in America, right? It's all in the fabric of, of America. Absolutely right. So we're going to talk about a couple of those things very quickly. But before we do, let us take a moment and we're going to roll our, um, what I would call our theme song. We are very delighted that um, a relative, uh, Jam Jamel Brown, who is a gifted, gifted Christian hip hop artist, he wrote and rapped and produced a theme song for us, and we're going to play it today. Um, we've had it some time, but we're introducing it to our Legal Rebel audience. So here it is. That Corbin and Corbin legal team Fighting for the rights of the people That filed the daughter team Investing in the youth When the system ain't treating them equal Providing truth for our people We able to reach them So anytime you get accused for a crime And Lord knows you ain't do it We here to get you through it Exemplifying prudence And glorifying God Making sure you're compensated For other people's doings Our vision is to be one of the best We're small enough to focus on your matter Throughout the neighborhoods of Dallas Working constantly and making sure your rights are protected a firm team of lawyers, aggressive, effective A team that has your back in the courtroom Two well-spoken black lawyers in the courtroom Investing time and resources when it's evident that you were treated wrong Now you walking out of Dallas courtroom with a settlement Corbin and Corbett, the father-daughter legal tag team that has your back in the courtroom Our purpose is simple All right, man, I, I really like that theme music. You love it, Chloe? I love it. I love hip-hop, so... You know, having a cousin who can actually rap and who's a hip hop artist and who ha who can spit, um, you know, make our theme song for us is amazing. So I'm so glad we were able to deb debut it um, on the channel and the podcast today. Yes. Uh, again, his name is Jamel Brown and he has um, a CD out. It's called One Way, uh, Christian Hip Hop Artist. I mean, the dude is gifted. He's talented with the writing part of it, the rapping part of it, the producing part of it, just all around musical, gifted, and talented. You can find his music on uh, iTunes, and um, you can uh, watch one of the videos on YouTube. Um, so just look him up, Jamel Brown. A-M-E-L Brown. Go check him out. You will not be disappointed, I promise you. Yeah, so I, I heard the a M E L Brown. I didn't hear the J. Did you say J? Yeah, J A M E L Brown. Okay, I I don't know. It just kind of cut off the J. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, my nephew. So go check him out, y'all. Go check him out. All right. So Chloe, let's talk about the Arbery trial here a little bit. Yeah. So there's been a lot of updates since the last video we made about the the Arbery and Rittenhouse trial. Um, I think we're about to play this clip 
from one of the defense attorneys um, some comments that he made uh, a couple days ago in this trial. So let's go ahead and roll the clip now. Obviously, there's only so many pastors they can have. And if that, their pastor's Al Sharpton right now, that's fine. But then that's it. We don't want any more black pastors coming in here or other Jesse Jackson, whoever was in, was in here earlier this week, sitting with the victim's family, trying to influence a jury in this case. If a bunch of folks came in here dressed like Colonel Sanders with white masks sitting in the back, I mean, that would be good. So there you have it. This clip has been seen around the, the country and probably around the world, I'm sure. Um, so um, what do you think about what he said, Dad? Let's get into it. Wow. So, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I, I am an African-American criminal defense attorney. OK. And so when I look at these things, I sort of see them through the eyes of a of both of an African-American and as a criminal defense attorney. And sometimes and pastor. and pastor. That's right. Thank you. And pastor. So an African-American pastor lawyer. And so <laughs> all three of those uh, positions, if you will, kind of inform my opinion on this. So let me go ahead and get. The, the, let me get the let me get the African American part out. So I, I I believe these three men. I believe personally. I believe the evidence based on that video showed that they murdered Amal Albury. A, as an African American, I believe they mar, uh, murdered him. I don't see self defense. I don't buy this garbage about a citizen's arrest. I think they committed murder just based on the video. Okay. Now, look, I am a criminal defense attorney. I know that they are presumed innocent until the jury finds them guilty or unless the jury finds them guilty. Uh, but that's just my opinion. So that's my position as an African-American. Now, as a criminal defense attorney, I have had to make objections on the record you and I both have had to make objections on the record that would have been offensive to family members, to other folks in the courtroom. I've been there. I've done that. I know what that's all about. You're in fight mode. We have an ethical obligation to zealously uh, represent our client and defend him or her, and that's what we do. I mean, when you're in trial, you're literally in a legal battle uh, for uh, the freedom, for the life of your client. And so you will do what is necessary to win the case so long as it's legal and ethical, right? And sometimes we, we, we do things. I remember in one murder trial that uh, we were defending, um, the family members were sitting in the back of the courtroom or sitting in the, you know, in the courtroom and they were weeping uncontrollably. I mean, and understandably so they had lost a loved one and I'm representing uh, the guy who took their loved one. And, but my concern was that this was going to really prejudice the jury, you know, seeing the family members sitting in there weeping uncontrollably. And so I had to stand up and, Asked the judge, I think I did it out of the presence of the jury, I think, if I remember correctly. But we definitely had to ask the jury, ask the judge to uh, speak to the family and ask them to control that weeping. Um, and it didn't feel good doing it. We looked like some heartless lawyers. I get it, but we had to do it. It was necessary for our client. It could have been considered ineffective assistance of counsel had we not done it. So, so we're in those situations as lawyers oftentimes. Now, I'm not making excuses for what this man said, uh, but I am just trying to explain from a lawyer's perspective, not from a layperson's perspective. I've already expressed myself as a, as a layperson, as an African-American looking at this trial. But as a professional, as a lawyer, as a licensed attorney who have tried these kinds of cases, um, I've done similar things, okay? Was, it, was his comments insensitive? Yes. 
Were they appropriate? Maybe so. Um, but, you know, we have to, you know, we're looking at it sort of, sort of Monday morning quarterbacking. And now he did come back and apologize, and I think the judge kind of shut him down. You know, the, you know, the judge was not was not having it. Um, and do keep in mind the courtroom is a public place. The public is is welcome to come in and sit in in trials. Uh, Al Sharpton, uh, Jesse Jackson, Reverend Jesse Jackson, Reverend Al Sharpton, uh, they are welcome to come in, although they're civil rights leaders. Um, so I, again, get, as a criminal defense lawyer, I get why this comment was made. It was insensitive. Uh, it has riled up a lot of people. But uh, whether it was appropriate, I don't know. But now here's the point I do want to make. I think that he accomplished what he wanted to accomplish. The judge shut him down. And, you know, the judge didn't bar uh, Reverend Sharpton, Reverend Jackson from coming into court or any other reverend. And I've seen where some of the pastors down in Georgia plan to meet up at the courthouse in a few days. So this has gotten them all stirred up and rightfully so. And I'm a pastor, right? So, uh, I, I I get it from that perspective as well, going in and wanting to support the family, wanting to, you know, stand up and make your presence known for justice, racial justice, criminal justice, reform, all of that. Um, but I think he accomplished what he set out to accomplish. And let me explain what I mean. If there's one thing white Southerners despise, it is so-called outside agitators. People coming in from outside their communities and trying to tell them how they should run their communities, how they should treat their blacks. Okay, I mean, I've literally heard this over the years. Outside agitators. And this lawyer knows, he's from that area, he knows, he is one of them. He is a white Georgian, and he knows how they resent that. And so him just being able to stand up and, and make that motion, get it on television, for it to be broadcast throughout that community, and undoubtedly get back to the jury, because that's who he's talking to. He's not really talking to the, to the, to the judge. He's trying to get that across to the jury. He's trying to inflame them. He's trying to tap into their resentment of, you know, the Reverend Al Sharpton and, and the Reverend Jesse Jackson and the Reverend whomever coming and influencing the jury. He's sending a message to the jury. And he knows that message is going to reach the jury because it's all over television. How is it not going to reach the jury? Um, so I think he has already accomplished what he set out to do. He tapped into that jury's sensibilities about outside, so-called outside agitators, and they are now probably inflamed and, and, and angry and resent the fact that you got Al Sharpton. They may not have even had, had even noticed that he came, but they know now. They know now. And um, so I think it was what, what folks don't realize is in a trial, you have not only the legal things going on, but you have a whole lot of psychodrama going on as well. Both sides are trying to do whatever they can to influence the jury. Both sides. So you not only got the objections and the, and the testimony and the witness witnesses and the evidence and the pictures and the, all of this, but you got some psychological subtle drama that's happening as well. And that is where I would categorize him standing up in court, knowing that it would get on TV and get back to the jury. I think he accomplished what he set out to accomplish. And that is making that jury resent the fact that outside agitators are coming in and trying to influence them. We are talking, after all, about a jury that consists of 11 people, 11 whites out of, out of 12, 12 uh, jury members, one black out of 12. Um, 
So he 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 definitely accomplished what he set out to do. Yeah, he had two goals. One, to put his objections on the record. Um, and two, just like you said, to try to influence the jury as much as possible. And just to add a little bit further about what goes into the mind of defense attorneys during trial, we have to make sure that we have a clean record um, during the course of the trial. And what I mean by that is if the case does not go our way and we need to appeal what the jury decides to a higher court um, or even up to the Supreme Court, we need to make sure that we have objections on the record, that we have made statements on the record that the the judges can look at because they're not going to look at new evidence typically with an appeal. They're going to look back to what happened during that trial. And if he had not made that type of objection, it could have been seen that he waived, you know, bringing up to what he thought was objectionable um, with Reverend Al, Shapton, Reverend Al Sharpton being in um, the courtroom could be an intimidation for the jury. And he may not have been able to use that objection if he needed to appeal the case if his client is found guilty. So we're thinking about a lot of things during trial. We really are in war mode. When I, when we are preparing for trial, I feel like I am going to battle, like I'm a soldier in Afghanistan or something, um, because there's so much at stake and there's so much that we have to think about. So I imagine he was trying to make sure that just on the record, his objection was noted, as well as trying to influence the jury and put in their minds, just like you said, look, there are these outside people here trying to take the, the decision out of your hands and put it on them. And so I agree, it's, it's a combination of things, as well as the psychodrama as well. Even what we wear, we think about what we wear. We think about how we talk during trial. We think about how we act because the jury members are going to look at us and make instant decisions and in how we act, how we talk, when we object, how we stand up, how we address the, the judge. All of that goes into their perceptions of us and it's something that we have to think about. And I mean, the members of the jury are, are people just like us and people we, we come in with our biases and our stereotypes. We try to get as unbiased a jury as possible during voir dire. Um, during jury selection, but people still have what have their beliefs. And so whoever can have the most influence on the jury, that typically will decide what direction the, the jury decides to go. So yep. even though I do find his comments, and I understand them as a defense attorney as well. And I think they were necessary for his client to and for it to be put on the record. Yeah. <clears throat> and I want to harp on what you said necessary for his client. Not only to, as you said, to develop the record. And by the record, by the way, we mean the, tr the transcript of the, uh, the court reporter who's keeping all the words and, you know, writing everything down and as well as all the documents and so forth. And all that stuff is what goes to the appellate court uh, if we appeal. And that's all the appellate court has because in the appeals process, uh, you don't the, the 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 appellate judges don't hear testimony. They don't hear live witnesses. They only have that record of all that went on in that in that proceeding in that trial, et cetera. Um, so yeah, we're doing everything we can to protect the interests of the of the client. But there's something else too, Chloe. We're also wanting the client to think and believe and feel like we fought for them. Yeah. Right. So he wanted his clients to 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 know that look, I'm dude, I'm fighting for you, even when it seems to be unpopular, even when it seems to be controversial, even if the judge doesn't like it, whoever doesn't like it, I am fighting for you. Remember that I'm your lawyer and I'm going for it, even if it makes me look like a racist or an idiot. And he accomplished that, by the way. <laughs> he looked. <laughs> He looked like both a racist idiot. No question about it. But uh, yeah. sub sometimes the things we do for our clients are, and, and again, I'm not justifying what he did. I'm just trying to say I've done similar things, Chloe, and you have too. I mean, where you are just trying to, uh, you know, give your client the best possible chance of winning even if you got to say something on the record that is, you know, 
you know it's just going to be, um, it's not going to be received well. It's not going to well, be received. Well, that attorney-client relationship is so sacred, and we owe the ultimate duty and loyalty to our clients, obviously within the bounds of the law. But ethically, as attorneys, our duty are to our clients, and our loyalty are is to our clients. And nobody else. And nobody else. That's right. It is the client only. So if the client noticed um, Reverend Al Sharpton and had an issue, or if the attorney noticed it and felt like that this really could intimidate the jury, the attorney had a duty to state that and state it on the record and make sure that it was put on the record so that anyone who looks at the transcript knows that this is what we objected to. So that relate that attorney client relationship is so important and it's so, it's so strong um, that we have to, we have to make sure that it's protected and we have to make sure that the client is protected. So I imagine he was doing it for that reason as well. And I get it. I truly do. I get it. We probably would have done the same thing. That's right. Um, we discussed off camera. Let's say that we were defending someone. That's right. I'm yeah. um, a black man. And there were, the, you know, a bunch of police officers came in the courtroom. That's right. And just stood there, just sat there intimidated um, and trying to intimidate our client. We would have objected on the record about that, too. Yes. It's very similar. So 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 let's so let's let's develop that. So let's say let's assume hypothetically we're representing a black man who killed a police officer. Yes. And uh the the courtroom is filled with police officers in full uniform, you know, who uh, you know just decked out the in their regalia and full uniform and the jury's looking at that. You better believe we would be concerned about this having an influence on the jury. And when the jury was out of, um, out of, you know, taken in the back in the deliberating room, there's no question we would have would have raised the same objection. Now, I'm not saying, and I know that you're not saying that this guy is not a racist idiot. It could have no. just it could have just been coming out of that place. He could yeah. have been saying that just out of the place of being a racist idiot. But I, we're just suggesting that as criminal defense attorneys, we have to make objections sometimes on the record that just are offensive. Yeah. And that's what happened. <laughs> that's exactly what happened. Now, there's one other thing, um, a couple other quick things about the Al, the Almond uh, Albury trial that I want to talk about real quickly. One is the lack of media coverage. Well, you may say, "Well, I see this all over all over the the media." No, nah, I I've, I've been kind of paying attention. For example, this morning on the Today Show, I typically look at the Today Show about every morning. And they led, after they said all their preliminary stuff, they led with something to this effect. Well, it's a very busy news day, and we got three legal cases that are going on that we need to talk about. And they were Steve Bannon, um, Britney Spears, and Kyle Rittenhouse. And my mouth dropped. I'm like, whoa, where's Ahmad, Where's the Ahmad Albury trial? Is that not worthy of attention? I mean, what, how did that get left? It is certainly more important than Britney Spears. It is definitely more important than Britney Spears getting control of her millions of dollars. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. am I... I mean, am I telling the truth? I mean, it's definitely more important than that. And yeah. so it should have been one of those three, but they didn't cover it. In fact, they didn't cover it the first 30 minutes of their broadcast. I sent them a tweet, too. I tweeted them. Why Why are you all disregarding the Ahmad Albury trial? Um, because it's a black victim. Because it's a black hunting. victim with white defendants. Absolutely. And and who are the folks in the newsrooms? who are making decisions about what gets airtime and what doesn't white, white producers and a so, uh, what do you call them? Executive producers and, and so on. 
Yeah. And, and, and the reason I think this trial needs to be covered so closely, Chloe, is because of the obvious reasons, but the, but the non-obvious uh, reason that it has striking similarities to the Emmett Till uh, tragedy. Striking similarities. Okay? Some, some folks may be too young to really know about the Emmett Till trial. In fact, I wasn't born myself. Uh, when Emmett Till was was murdered. I think he was murdered in the 50s. I was born in, in the early 60s. Uh, but I heard about it all throughout all my life. And we've all seen the pictures of him in that in that casket. But essentially what happened was he was murdered by two white men because he allegedly whistled or said something that they deemed inappropriate to a white woman, one of their wives. And for that, they went to his uncle's house, snatched him out of the bed in the middle of the night, took him and savagely beat him and threw his body in a river. Uh, All because he supposedly, allegedly said something that they deemed inappropriate to a white woman, which was taboo in that day. And so eventually they found uh, Emmett's body And they put these men on trial. It was an all-white jury, all-white jury that found him, that found those two men not guilty. Now, the similarities are striking. A black victim, two in Auburn's case, uh, uh, three men took part in his killing. Two, at least two that we know of, there were probably more involved, killed Emmett. In the Emmett Till trial, they had an all-white jury. In this one, there's a there are eleven out of out of twelve white jurors. In the South, um, you know, white judge. I mean all the similarities and then Emmett's in at Emmett's trial black segregation was going on the blacks had to sit at the top of the of the courtroom whites at the bottom down there and so when I heard this man this attorney talk about black pastors that also took me back to the Emmett Till trial where they where they there's one story there's this documentary called the eyes on the prize and in that documentary have you seen it Yes, and you all should watch it too. It's wow. It's eye opening. It's it's haunting. So 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 a congressman came came to the trial from Detroit, if I remember correctly. And he had to he had to speak to one of the bailiffs to get inside the courtroom because it was so crowded. And I mean, he was a US congressman. And so he told the bailiff who he was. The bailiff went up to the judge and basically said, there's a nigger outside who said he's here to see this nigger's funeral. And uh, the judge, you know, exchanged some words with the bailiffs and, and basically said, you know, let the nigger sit up there with, with the rest of the niggers. <laughs> I mean, mm. and, and, and so when, they, when the lawyer stands up and talks about Al Shopton that way and Jesse Jackson and black pastors generally, it, it just takes me back to the Emmett Till trial. The similarities are that striking. Yeah. And maybe it's they because I'm, I'm older. You know, I can remember some of these details and facts. Um, for that reason and many others, this trial should be, this trial should be getting national attention on all media outlets. It, it is atrocious what happened to Ahmaud Albury. Uh, these men ought to be found guilty. And America, this is another opportunity for America to come to grip with its serious racial problem. I agree. You know, you mentioned the bailiffs. I, I haven't experienced anything to that extent, but I've definitely experienced going into a courtroom as an attorney, um, going to the front of the courtroom where attorneys are allowed, the bailiffs coming up to me, asking me, what are you doing up here? Go sit in the back. 
um, let me see your your um, your bar card, all types of things. Um, I remember one time we were in a courtroom together and um, we were going to go sit where attorneys usually sit at the front of the courtroom. And the bailiff came over to us and said, y'all can't sit there. What are y'all doing? And we're like, we're attorneys. We can sit here. But just to keep the peace and keep the focus on our client, we went to another section at the front. Not two minutes later, several white attorneys go sit in that same spot. The bailiff didn't say anything. I can't tell our, our listeners how many times that happens. Um, so there is still there is still discrimination, even for attorneys in this legal system. Um, there is still discrimination in terms of the jury. We see that with the Ma Arbery, with the nearly all white jury. And I'm going to be honest, I don't believe this jury is going to convict these three men. Based on what I've seen so far, um, based on the testimony that I've heard, I, I don't, I, I'm not that confident that they're going to be guilty verdicts for these three men. I hope I'm wrong. Um, the trial is winding down. We'll see over the next few days. Well, you know, let me go back to that story that we, that you told about us being told by the bailiff, we couldn't sit in those chairs and lo and behold, 10, 15 minutes later, there were some white attorneys sitting there and he was talking to them. Not only were they sitting there, but they were in conversation. Yeah. Well, you didn't tell them what happened next. I confronted that bailiff. Yeah. I said, look, you told us we couldn't sit here. Yet these lawyers are sitting here and you're in a conversation with them. And he was like, well, sir, you know, I was just saying, uh, no, no, you told us that we could not sit in these chairs. But you let two white lawyers sit here and you're actually in a conversation with them. What's up with that? And um, so he didn't just get away with that. Uh, no, he, didn't he didn't get away with that. And he was he was kind of shamefaced after that. So I'm sure he learned his lesson. I'm sure he did based on the confrontation that you did of him, which is needed, which is what we have to do as black black people in this country. Well, and not only that, you and me, attorneys, uh, you a former prosecutor. I'm a pastor. We got racially profiled at a movie theater. Yeah. Spoke out against it. They called the police on us. This is at the church, after we had been in church, and and I preached that morning, and we had gone and had a Sunday afternoon meal as a family, thought we'd catch a movie, got racially profiled, and spoke out about it with an African-American manager yep. who called the police, had us arrested. We spent a night in jail. You, me, and uh, your brother, my son. My, uh, our, my wife, your mother, she didn't because, you know, we needed somebody to just, just be out trying to help us. But we took a stand, and it didn't matter whether we were law-abiding lawyers, Christians, pastors. All that mattered was really that we were African-American. And this was a yeah. black dude who put all this into action. A black man that I thought would understand why we were complaining about being racially profiled. So even some black folks, what's the old saying? All your skin folk ain't your kin folk? He was the epitome of that. Absolutely. We may have to make an episode about that. That could, yeah. that could help a lot of people about that situation. So... Stay tuned. We may make an episode about about what happened and how it how it better informed us as attorneys and how we became even better advocates for our clients and how we understand um, our criminal defense clients even more. Yes. So stay tuned. That may be coming. Absolutely. So there were some updates in the written house trial, too. I'm not going to take too long with this, but um, the judge and the prosecutor in that trial, they got into it. I'm smiling because I've gotten into it with judges before. Me too. It's just something that you you've gotten into it with judges before. <laughs> it's just something that you expect as as attorneys. Um, you always want to be respectful of the bench, 
But at the same time, we have to speak up for our clients and we have to make sure that we get our points across as well. Um, but in this case, I actually feel like the, the prosecutor was dead wrong. And um, I think he was he was trying to pull a fast one um, at the trial. So I, I, I'm not on his side on this. But just to give a brief explanation of what happened. So before before a trial starts for our listeners, there's usually something called a pre-trial hearing and several there's usually several hearings. And at these pre-trial hearings, um, the prosecutor and the defense attorneys, they will argue various motions before the judge, you know, saying, judge, hey, we need this type of evidence in or judge, please exclude this type of evidence or judge, um, please suppress, um, you know, some statements that my client made to the police, et cetera. So the judge makes a bunch of rulings on our on the motions at these pre-trial hearings. And in this particular case, the prosecutor asked the judge to to be able to present to the jury at the Rittenhouse trial a video of Cal Rittenhouse a few weeks before um, looking at some shoplifters at CVS and saying, I wish I could get my, my, my shotgun. So he wanted to introduce that evidence before the jury. At the pre-trial hearing, the judge said, no, you can't admit it. You cannot present that video to the jury. Now, fast forward. Skirt. <laughs> You know, a month later, the prosecutor is now cross-examining Rittenhouse after he testified while he's testifying, and he's trying to ask Rittenhouse questions about, you know, do you think it's acceptable to use deadly force against shoplifters? Do you think it's acceptable to use deadly force when someone is committing a crime, etc.? And this this pissed the judge off. The judge stopped the trial. The judge excused the jury, and the judge laid into the prosecutor. And um, what he's and the prosecutor's response was, well, judge, at the pre-trial hearing, you left the door open for me to ask these questions. <laughs> and that the judge said, and I quote, I left the door open for me, not you. <laughs> and keep in mind, this judge, he's an older, you know, 80, near 80 year old white judge known for being fiery. He's <laughs> he's a very fiery judge. So the, the everyone who's a litigator knows that when the judge makes a ruling and you still want to try to present the evidence, you must go to the front of the courtroom at, and with a sidebar with the pros and counsel and ask the judge if you can go to this line of questioning. The prosecutor did not do this in the did not do that in this case. He just tried to ask the questions, knowing that the judge had ruled against him at an earlier hearing. Now, on top of that. The prosecutor also asked Rittenhouse about his um, post-arrest silence, why he was silent after his arrest. And it is a fundamental constitutional right under the Fifth Amendment that every person in this country has a right against self-incrimination. We do not have to incriminate ourselves when the government um, brings charges against us. And you, and our silence, our using our right to not incriminate ourselves, our using our right to remain silent, cannot be used against us later at trial. And so the fact that this prosecutor was trying to question Rittenhouse about why he was silent after his arrest, that pissed the judge off as well. And the judge laid into him about that and saying, you know, he's this could be a grave constitutional violation, et cetera. But I agree with the judge on both counts. I agree that um, as a defense attorney, the prosecutor should not be questioning my client about why he was silent after he was arrested why he used his Fifth Amendment right not to incriminate himself. I agree that that's a constitutional violation. I agree with the judge that the judge already made the ruling. You cannot bring in, you know, video from two weeks ago that's unrelated to this incident to try to say that my client is has propensity for being a vigilante. Oh, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. This has got to be a minute or two of the verdict, okay, because – I want to. I want to offer. I want to offer a different opinion. Okay, so hold on. Okay. Go for it. So, Judge, may it please the court, opposing counsel. What you just saw the prosecutor pull was a fast one. And it was a violation of the, the protections that our, our United States Constitution 
offers every person accused of a crime in this country. The Fifth Amendment states that we have a right against self-incrimination, that we do not have to incriminate, incriminate ourselves when we are accused of a crime in this country. And the fact that my client exercised his Fifth Amendment rights not to incriminate himself, exercised his right to call an attorney, and exercised his right to remain silent cannot, cannot be used against him or to infer that he was trying to hide something. And that is the questioning that this prosecutor is trying to trying to do here. And this prosecutor is an experienced um, assistant district attorney. He should know that this is a, a violation of my client's rights. So I ask that you admonish, admonish this prosecutor and to not allow him to get into any inference or questions about why my client was silent after he was arrested. Also, Your Honor, we will ask that you uphold your earlier ruling that any reference to a video or any comments made in a video, um, alleging my client saying some statements about getting his shotgun cannot be inferred or referenced or questioned about um, during um, the prosecutor's cross-examination. So we would ask that you would continue to uphold your earlier ruling that that video is, is irrelevant and cannot be presented to the jury and to stop any questioning about why my client was silent after his arrest. Thank you. Well, Judge, um, I, I completely disagree with the, um, with the defense in this case. Um, you made your earlier ruling, but it, you know, is the, it's, it's the responsibility of the defense to, in a motion in limine, to let, you know, to, to, to once again object. And then at that point we go and hold a sidebar, like you said. Um, what we are not expecting to see in this type of situation, Your Honor, is for you to, with all due respect, for you to so strongly and sternly, you know, take the side of the defense here on a situation where uh, we had the right once again to, to, to try and offer the evidence. And if the defense doesn't want that evidence entered, then the defense can, can object and we approach. And at that point, you remind us of what you'd already uh, previously ruled. And and we can um, then move on on both fronts, not only on the not only on this silence, but um, but on the other issues as well. Um, so uh, you, you know, it was not unethical for us to once again try and get evidence in that we think is very critical in this case. After all, two people lost their lives here, and. You know, truth of the matter is this young man should have never showed up here with the, with an AR-15 or whatever it was, uh, an AR-15. Uh, had he not done that, had he allowed the police to do their jobs, these two men and their families, their lives would be completely different. They would still be here and the families would not be devastated. Um, so we, we have a job to do just like the defense does, and it is to protect the citizens of Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, so the fact that we tried once again to get evidence in, especially on the motion in limine, um, is us doing our jobs. And again, the defense objected. We approach, and you remind us of what you already said, and and um, and that you know that should be the end of it. So that is the position of the state. Your Honor, one last thing. Uh, the prosecutor knew what, what you ruled at that hearing, and he knew that he was trying to pull a fast one. Um, and even if, even if we approached, the mere fact that he asked questions to my client um, could put an, an inference in the juror's mind, as well as any inference about my client's post-arrest silence. So for that, not only do we ask that you continue to keep the, the, the video out 
of my client supposedly making these statements and any questions about the post arrest silence. But we're going to ask this court to grant a mistrial with prejudice because we believe that even the inference that counsel made on the record could have an unfair um, prejudicial effect on the jury and that no further fair trial can be had in this case. So we would, we would ask for a mistrial and we request that the court grant a mistrial with pre prejudice today. All right. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I just wanted to kind of debate that a little bit. Um, yeah. I actually agree with you. And it, it's refreshing to see a judge this pro defense because we don't we don't see that often. Not we, often at all. At all. I, I can never remember a judge chewing a prosecutor out like that. Uh, we just don't see that. And this thing about not allowing the prosecutors to use the word victim, I mean, blew my mind because how many times have we felt like the prosecutors were manipulating the jury just in the use of that word because it hadn't been proven yet that, you know, the person who was killed or injured or what have you is in fact a victim or was in fact a victim until the jury says so or, or the judge That's a hot so. take, Dad. So we agree with this judge because I agree with you that as defense attorneys, we don't want the person who was injured, allegedly injured or killed at trial to be referenced as a victim until our, unless our client is found guilty. That's, That's a right. hot take. That's right. That's a hot take. So we, we kind of applaud this judge for the way that he's handling this case all as the, defense attorneys. Yes, that's right. Although, although, although Wittenhouse, Rittenhouse, I mean, uh, probably to in my mind should be found guilty, although he won't. I can he tell should. you that now that, you know, yeah, you, he won't. I agree with your assessment of what the jury is going to do in the Arbery case. They're, they're not going to, uh, find, I think, didn't you say that you don't think that they were going to find these three men guilty? I agree with you. Mm -mm. I, I, I think it's almost impossible, uh, because what a lot of folks don't, don't realize is the, the, the uh, defense just has to raise reasonable doubt with, like here in Texas, just raise reasonable doubt with one person uh, yeah. because all of them have to agree on the guilty verdict. And so just one person can at least hang a jury. And yeah. so I presume the same thing is true in Georgia. And, and so all the chances of 11 of those white folks back in, in Georgia finding those three men guilty, no. And the chances of this, all the members of this Rittenhouse jury finding him guilty are very, very, very slim. I think probably next week we will end up with not guilty verdicts in both trials. I agree. I think closing statement starts in the Rittenhouse trial on Monday, so – um, we'll, we'll likely know next week yeah. what happens. And I, I agree that probably going to be a not guilty. So doesn't, um, doesn't, uh, closing statements begin in the Albury trial too next week, maybe. I think so as well. Yeah. So I'm thinking we'll know probably by this time next week, what the verdicts are. Again, I think I agree with you. I think there are going to be not, not guilty verdicts. All right. Yeah. Okay. So. That wraps it up, Chloe. It has been exhilarating discussing these two cases and giving our audience uh, an update and some some context on various things, right? Yeah. Especially That's the black context is always important. Always yeah. important. That's right. Especially the black pastor's comment. Um, yeah. You know, me as as an African American, as a black pastor lawyer. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of all over the place with that. You know, as an attorney, I can completely understand this guy saying that as a black pastor. No, no, it was, yeah. it was, uh, over the top. Yeah, I agree. All right. So this has been a pleasure. Um, we will be back on Wednesday with a new video and podcast. Make sure you go check out our podcast guys. 
The podcast just went live. You can find us on Spotify, iTunes, or you can go to the defiantlawyers.podbean.com. Um, that will be in the description down below. Um, but check out our podcast too. If you're in your car or you're not somewhere where you can be in front of the computer looking at video or you're at work and you want something to listen to, go back and, and listen to our podcast. I will see you all next Wednesday. Um, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Take care, Rebels. All right. I enjoyed it, Chloe, as always, having a dialogue with you about these legal issues. Look, this is what we do every day. It's our passion. We enjoy it. We enjoy being in the courtroom. We enjoy trial. We enjoy being defiant lawyers and taking on these issues as well as stingy insurance companies and greedy corporations and 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 arrogant opposing counsel and, and racist entities. We enjoy being defiant lawyers. All right, so we're out of here. You all have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That Corbin and Corbin legal team fighting for the rights of the people that by the daughter team investing in the youth when the system ain't treating them equal providing truth for our people we able to reach them so anytime you get accused for a crime and Lord knows you ain't do it we here to get you through it exemplifying prudence and glorifying God making sure you're compensated for other people's doings our vision is to be one of the best we're small enough to focus on your matter throughout the neighborhoods of Dallas working constantly and making sure your rights are protected a firm team of lawyers, aggressive, effective A team that has your back in the courtroom Two well-spoken black lawyers in the courtroom Investing time and resources when it's evident that you were treated wrong Now you walking out of Dallas courtroom with a settlement Corbin and Corbett, the father-daughter legal tag team that has your back in the courtroom Our purpose is simple, to obtain a favorable outcome for each client And glorify Christ in all we do Our vision is to be one of the best and most